Welcome. I'm Julian Rogers in the Turks and Caicos. We had a chat with the Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands, none other than the Honorable Washington Mizik. He is the current Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, who are due to hold their Governors meeting here in the Turks and Caicos in June. We'll talk to the Premier not only about his role as the leader of the country, but also as that of the President of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank and also the President of the UK Overseas Territory Association. He chairs the rotational position as the political council. He's also the Vice President of the Turks and Caicos branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and a representative of the Turks and Caicos Caribbean Heads of Government Meetings, of course, for CARICOM. He's also have that role of building the relationship with regional institutions as well. So, we welcome you, sir. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Welcome you, Turks and Caicos. I'm looking forward to a fantastic time here with the rest of the Caribbean and for the CDB board meeting. Let's talk first, Premier, about the Turks and Caicos. How have you done? Turks and Caicos has done extremely well. I mean, in terms of where we are and the recognition of the progress that's been made here, uh, it's all been fairly new. Every, just about everything you see around here is less than 50 years old. So we're basically, can be considered a new kid on the block, if you like. But uh, we've had a we have a very successful economy. Um, tourism obviously is our uh, main industry. In fact, it is sometimes said that Turks and Caicos is probably the most tourism dependent country in the world next to Macau. And, um, but we've done very well. We've, we have been able to uh, consistently for the better part of the last six years produce a surplus in our um, revenue, government uh, revenue, our budgets. Uh, we have a triple B plus credit rating. Government have zero debt um, and a very hefty reserve, including a sovereign wealth fund. So I think we're doing very well, all things considered. You know. As you say that, I have to ask you, how did you survive COVID? A confluence of of events or circumstances meant that we pulled through COVID very, very good. Uh, we had, um, we had uh, assistance from the United Kingdom. Uh, we got the vaccine early. Our population responded quickly. So we ramped up to about 80% of vaccination rate by the end of the summer of 20. Uh, it would have been 2021, I think it would be. And then, of course, the fact that we entered the COVID with significant reserve, we were able to really preserve life and, and livelihood by actually uh, assisting the population through stimulus grants and other, other assistance. So, yeah, we, we've, we've done very well uh, through COVID. So having gone through that period, what really are the new priorities here? Well, you know, there's a word that's overused sometimes called sustainability. And our focus is on building resilience and sustainability. Um, and that involves uh, focusing on ensuring that they, not only sustainability in terms of the economy, uh, but also in terms of our sensitive environment, which is very much tied to the economy. Everyone in, these, in this island and this country makes their living off the natural capital of the economy. So we're very concerned about ensuring that that is preserved, but also creating the, keeping us a, a good social balance. Turks and Caicos depend very, very largely on foreign labor. And so we've got issues of housing and all of those kinds of things that we've got to focus on to ensure that the environment is not degraded and the five-star destination that we are known for is actually maintained. So yes, those are some challenges, but I think we, we've, we've designed and are designing um, solutions and approaches uh, to ensure that uh, the, our economy and our social and environmental um, sectors are, are, are sustainable. You're fresh from presenting a budget to this country. What would you 
say are the priority items that you're addressing in this? You know, um, a big umbrella issue of my government is human capital development. Okay. Also, another big issue at the moment is price inflation. Um, so, what we, and of course, the, the social quality of life issues. So, what the, my budget includes a lot of deals with how do we protect the vulnerable. So, people are looking for social assistance. We've upped the, the level of assistance. Uh, investing huge amount of money in scholarships, grants, and full scholarships, and investing in education. We just acquired property to put uh, ex uh, TVAT, expanding or putting, standing up in place a well functioning hospitality school. Uh, so the focus really is on the human capital development, improving the social. Uh, situation of the uh, public and also investing heavily in infrastructure because I believe that wealth is created by the private sector. Government distributes it but is created by the private sector and the private sector needs to have solid, um, dependable, sustainable infrastructure in order to, to run on and to develop uh, that wealth. Let's talk about the infrastructure. It seems the airport is a major priority here. This destination is well served from probably over a dozen gateways in the United States. Uh, the United States and North America generally is our source market for tourism. Uh, we actually have outgrown our current facility uh, and, and we have to be improvising in order to process the traffic. Uh, so we're making a huge, huge investment in developing a whole new terminal uh, that's going to probably run us into uh, multiple millions of dollars. We're making some good progress with the consultancy, looking at the structure, ownership structure, the funding structure, uh, and um, hopefully we can all have that done between now and the end of the year, so by next year we can look at uh, scheduling the actual construction time, which I believe will, will probably uh, begin in 2024. Uh, these big projects have huge life cycle. It takes a long planning cycle. And so it's, we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, we're fortunate in that the airports authority itself have significant reserves. Uh, and so we're, we're, we should be able to do it quite comfortably without actually um, consigning the facility to to an outside operator. What about the communication around the islands themselves? The communication around Turks and Caicos is in need of improvement. Uh, dependency uh, or the, the ability to communicate between the islands, particularly in a bad hurricane, is a problem. And we are now looking at actually putting a fiber ring around the islands to improve that. That is something that is also uh, topical. And again, I expect that, that we'll, we'll see some movement on that in the current financial year. Let's talk now about the relationships you, may, you have with, 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 with the nearby territories, like the Bahamas, for instance. Well, the Bahamas is considered to be family because their bloodlines, of course, the nearest Bahama Island is 40 miles off from here. Uh, Anagua, Mayaguana, between 40 to 60 miles away. And so um, there's always been freedom of movement between here and the Bahamas. Even when the, uh, even in relationship to the, to the legislation is not strictly adhered to when it comes to the movement of people between here and Bahamas. Everybody in the Turks and Caicos Islands and everybody just about in the Bahamas have families in both places. So that relationship is probably our strongest relationship uh, because of the, uh, the our proximity, but also because of the bloodlines between us. Um, of course, in my capacity as the um, president of the 
Caribbean Development Bank, I represent the overseas territories. Uh, the position, of course, as you know, is rotational. So I, I represent uh, places like uh, the British Virgin Islands, Montserrat, and Gwilder, um, Cayman. and the Cayman Islands, yeah. and Turks and Caicos. Um, but our relationship, our strongest relationship, remains with uh, the Bahamas. And the historic relationship with, say, Jamaica? We have a historic relationship with Jamaica because we were sort of a sub dependence of the UK through Jamaica up until 19, when Jamaica became independent in 1962, right? Mm -hmm. Then we uh, shared a governor with the Bahamas until the Bahamas became independent. And since then we've had our own, set up our own governor. So we're more direct, the, the relationship has become more direct between us and the United Kingdom ever since then. But um, we still maintain a very strong relationship with Jamaica. Uh, of course, a lot of us, including myself, would have been educated in Jamaican institutions or regional institutions yeah. based in Jamaica. Um, so that relationship is very strong, perhaps stronger than it is in the Eastern Caribbean, again, because of proximity and, and history. I want to expand that then to the TCI's relationship with the rest of the Caribbean. Uh, let's talk about your role in CARICOM. I consider myself personally a Caribbean man because I've had the privilege of living in uh, and visiting and developing relationships with people across the region. And, and so, and I've been around, been involved in public life long enough to appreciate the contributions that have been made uh, by the region. Uh, we've, in the past, we've sourced teachers, doctors, engineers, police officers, uh, and you name it, from different parts of the Caribbean, particularly places like Barbados. Uh, and more recently, a large number of our police officers have been coming from places like St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, I have strong relationships with, with uh, many of the leaders in the region uh, by virtue of the, my the long time I've spent in politics and meeting them one-on-one -on -one and developing relationships. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've come to value that, the importance of it. And while our growth has been uneven, mm -hmm. I think it's critical that we kind of develop a mentality of one for all and all for one because we live in a region that's very volatile and uh, one could be up today and down tomorrow and so that sort of a dependence and the strength of having each other's back, it, to me, is very critical. And so uh, that is something that I, I believe in. And I think in my role is something that I would like to, to focus on and promote, that regardless to where each of us may be in terms of our growth, economic growth, uh, we should and could contribute to the region and complete, and, and especially to the bank's operation and the bank's sustainability and survivability because I noticed in a lot of cases with some of the more prosperous economies, uh, they, there's this tendency not to appreciate the significant role that the, that the bank pay, plays and I, I think that is very short-sighted. I'll just ask you to just respond to the offer from the president of Guyana, for instance, to deal with food security by offering the, the, the vast land space of, of Guyana for production of food and distribution across the region? Well, I think that it was very magnanimous uh, of him. I think for a place like the Turks and Caicos, it was a small population and, and significantly removed. The logistical issue of transportation could be a problem in making use of that, even if you have persons here who may want to invest in agriculture or in growing food, there's still the question of how do you get it here. Um, so, I, but I do believe um, there may be opportunities uh, to trade with a place like Guyana, particularly if, when one look at, I, I don't know what's the state of their forestry products are, but given our construction boom here in these islands, if there are materials or construction materials that could be sourced from a place like that, 
it would be great. I mean, at the moment, we're sourcing it from uh, other places in the Caribbean, uh, including Haiti and the, and the Dominican Republic, and, uh, and Cuba, which are, tend to be a little closer. But um, again, when you look at what Guyana offers, I mean, most of the light poles <laughs> are from Guyana. And when you look at the, the quality of the lumber, would the, I, I think there are opportunities there to cross and vest uh, across this region in each other's economy to the benefit of the region. I think sometimes we, we don't realize the strength that we have. We look out for everything and um, ignore the possibility of developing uh, uh, the relationships that we have like cross investing in each other's economy making it making it easier I mean a great example has been the Sandals Corporation and their ability to tap into the resources and provide employment opportunities for many uh, many destinations within the region including Turks and Caicos in fact uh, in a lot of destinations the airline services have been improved as a result of having a large player such as sandals. And as you, may, as you mentioned, an airline, you certainly have a, a good example in terms of interregional carriage with Inter-Caribbean. Yeah, we're very proud of Inter-Caribbean and its ability to reach out to the rest of the Caribbean uh, sister territories. And I'm hoping that they can continue to, with the expansion and their investment. Uh, for us, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of pride to be able to to be able to do that. Yeah. Let's turn our attention to, to, the, to, the, to one of the other caps, that is the, the Board of Governors of the Overseas Territories. Um, you've had this now role for some time uh, as part of this rotation. What would you say are the priorities? The Overseas Territories in the Caribbean uh, have done well, by and large. Uh, most of them, certainly the Cayman Islands and Turks and Caicos, uh, have done very well. Some of the other uh, territories in the Eastern Caribbean have not done quite as well. There's a terminology in, that came from a book that was written by another Caribbean personality that says, small is beautiful, I think. Uh, and I think we underestimate the strength and the ability that we can and the role that we can play in the, in the region and in the CDB. Um, and what I would like for my colleagues in the uh, overseas territories to do is to, even though I am the, the rotational governor and the chair, uh, I would certainly want to get their full support uh, because I do believe that we could um, we could uh, make this particular conference something extraordinary uh, and that their presence here could benefit them and, and, and the bank. Uh, I, I can certainly see a situation where um, certainly the Cayman Islands and Turks and Caicos are no longer um, sort of a, um, even though we may be borrowing countries, uh, we are no longer dependent on some of the concessionary uh, funding that the bank uh, is, uh, may have available, but um, some of our other sister territories are. And to the extent that we could contribute uh, to the, I don't know, to, to some kind of fund uh, to help with uh, pockets of needs in those territories or across the region. Um, I think that the kind of conversation we should start to have instead of constantly looking out for everything, because I think it's important to remember where we were once and relate that to where we are today and, and understand that um, the big wheel comes around and, you know, you never know if, if it'll ever happen again, you know. So that's what I um, would encourage them to do and hope, hope that we can play a, a pivotal role in the success and sustainability of the organization. The grouping as such um, has a particular relationship, obviously, with, with, with Britain. Um, 
how do you see the territories now helping to reshape the, the, the impression or, or the relationship with Britain? Well, I tell you one thing, global Britain, in my view, seems very keen on maintaining a relationship with the overseas territories. Um, I think it, it stands to reason that uh, exiting a, a Brexit, it means that the sphere of influence is less. Um, and also what we've seen recently with the royal visits through the region, uh, that, 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 cannot, uh, that cannot make the assumption any longer that uh, the former territories, the former colonies are happy and is prepared to carry on as usual. Um, so I think there seems to be a willingness to focus more attention on the remaining overseas territories. Um, and to the extent that there's this idea of offering the overseas territories a parliamentary representation, direct parliamentary representation in the UK. Uh, there are varying degrees of um, uh, views on that. Um, and it's not something I want to necessarily comment on because I think, uh, I, I don't think, I'm not, I don't support us being subsumed uh, into the UK or anything like that. But I think the relationship in more recent times, particularly in relationship to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, have actually served the, the Turks and Caicos and the overseas territories uh, uh, well. Um, so I don't know where that relationship would end, but, but clearly uh, there's a yearning from people everywhere to have control of their destiny. Um, and that's where, where I will leave that. But um, I believe we, we do have a, a role to play in the region, even as we also are influenced and are supported uh, uh, by the United Kingdom. Uh, we have to exert our dependency. I rather like the idea of playing the game without the name, uh, whatever. <laughs> because I think it will serve us well mm -hmm. uh, and I don't believe I believe relationships are more important than labels so that's that's my view and you wouldn't label that independence as I said I think playing the game without the name is what where my head is but you know I'm um, that decision is to be made by the next generation uh, we are in the process of advancing are developing a more advanced constitution or, or trying to, because what we've had, a, our constitution has regressed since 2006 as a result of the suspension in 2009. Uh, so we, we're looking at developing a more modern uh, partnership re relationship with the United Kingdom. Um, again, given our size, uh, we have to be concerned, uh, and particularly Turks and Caicos, given where we are located uh, with huge uh, neighbors that are not necessarily quite as democratic as our tradition. We, we have to be careful about the relationships that we um, maintain. And as you talk about your neighbors, Cuba? Cuba uh, is, uh, we have Cuba, we got Hispanola, both are which are within a hundred miles of our shores. Um, those are, and of course, our neighbor, the Bahamas. Uh, Jamaica is about 400 plus miles away from us. Um, but that's, that's would be our neighborhood there. But, um, and you're comfortable in that neighborhood? The biggest threat to Turks and Caicos uh, sovereignty, if you can call it that, since we're not a nation, is really the threat from illegal immigration from uh, our neighbors next door to the south of us. Uh, and I do believe the region and the world have an, op an obligation uh, to do a better job of assisting our neighbors in Haiti uh, so that 
they are not trafficked because a large part of what happened is literally trafficking. Uh, poor people don't even know where they're going sometimes, you know. Uh, so again, as we dis as I discussed with the president in the past, to the extent that the CDB and the region uh, could develop initiatives to help some of our neighbors who are um, may want to leave, if we can create some conditions at home which would prevent that from happening, fewer people will leave and fewer people will lose their lives on the high, sea, try, high seas trying to escape poverty because it is an economic situation and, and it's one that I think developed countries ought to be doing more about and are not. Let's, let's return now to the, to the Caribbean Development Bank and its role. Uh, and you, you as governor, what would be your driving mantra to the bank at this stage? I mentioned early, I believe, I think the bank has an obligation to prove its own continued relevance as well, but it depends on the, the governors, all of the countries, right, uh, to take a keen interest in the future of the bank um, and to I think part of what I would like to see an expansion in the bank's membership, both regionally and globally. And what I'd like us to do again is to see how within, with interregionally, what we can do uh, to, to help each other. Again, using the phrase one for all and all for one. Uh, you know, there are some of us, some of our countries who are doing quite well. Uh, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be co contributing uh, to, the, to, to lifting some of, the, some of the other neighbors or focusing on projects within particular uh, neighborhoods within uh, our member, member states. So I, I think it's a, it's a fluid discussion that we have to have. I think there need to be some brainstorming around how the bank could continue to be relevant, how it can be sustainable, what kind of resilient uh, initiatives it needs to take. Uh, no, one, no one person has all of the answers, and that is the reason why it's very, very important for members to show up at the board meeting, and, uh, you know, so we can have these discussions. Because uh, I would not have detailed knowledge of what's happening in many of the sister or, or, the, or, or the member countries the borrowing member countries, unless that face-to-face -face dialogue is had and we can come up with a, a meeting of the minds, uh, it's difficult to, to divine what each person is thinking and, and where, the, where, specifically, where the specific needs are. You talk about resilience, a, a word used a great deal these days, sustainability, etc. How do you see those really impacting the choices we're making for the future of the Caribbean? Well, I, I believe resilience to me is a very broad word. Speak in terms both of physical and um, systemic. Physical, uh, of course, we live in a, in a part of the world which is very susceptible to, to severe storms, hurricanes, and so I think uh, we certainly need to be building on that kind of resilience. And I believe we do have institutions uh, that, uh, that have uh, sort of answered the call. Uh, Sedema, we've got um, um, the uh, strategic insurance program that helps the, the region as it relates to hurricanes through this. And this is all through the um, CARICOM. Yeah. Uh, but in relationship to the um, sustainability generally, I also believe there needs to be uh, more, uh, from a systems point of view, uh, and from a management or e of the economy point of view, uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. Uh, we've got smart people within our diaspora, we have smart people within the region, uh, they, there's, there can be more in terms of knowledge transfer. Uh, there can be 
And some of our people may even have resources that could be invested in, in the region to make the, it more economically sustainable, but also to make the, um, as I say, the management of the, of the region, both at the political level and at the business level, uh, sustainable and, and resilient. Uh, infrastructure, building infrastructure, we should make sure that those are resilient. So after, after a storm, you don't, they don't all disappear and now you have to start all over again. Um, you know, in Turks and Caicos, we've been very fortunate with the last hurricane that we've, we've our source of power is very resilient. I mean, we were literally up when countries were down for up to a year, we're literally up and running within six weeks, you know, after a very, very severe storm. So building resilience in terms of the physical plant, the, the, uh, the infrastructure, but also our systems of government. Um, we, the ability to expand our infrastructure rests to some extent on how we manage procurement. And I believe across the region, I'm hearing complaints about the sort of uh, um, um, anemic rate of drawdown on um, public sector investment uh, programs. And so this is where I think we can help each other. The CDB uh, in particular with its pool of, of knowledge and experience and expertise uh, can, can help, uh, particularly some of the smaller countries who may not be able to uh, purchase data within the confines of the, the boundaries of public service uh, pay scales. And, and so there are all sorts of ways that we can help each other to be more resilient. Finally, Premier, the, the CARICOM experience or experiment, some people talk about it. You, you, you obviously have great faith in it. Speak to the people. I believe the ability for people to move freely, uh, particularly at, a, at the sort of a tertiary education level is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but what I would, would hope we can move the next step to that. And I'm really serious about how we should look at having a sort of a Caribbean exchange where we can cross invest in each other's economy. I mean, we still have this ide ideology that if it comes from the outside, it's better, right? Uh, when in fact, there's so much we can do for ourselves. Uh, and so I, I, think, I think we need to, I don't think we know enough about each other, to be honest with you. And there's always a question of people fear what they don't know, right? And so I think there needs to be a, 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 some kind of serious effort in creating uh, systems that are transferable in actually creating um, standards that would uh, facilitate uh, the, the movement of people so that if someone from Turks and Caicos saw a, a job opportunity in Barbados, right, they had the same opportunity of, as a Barbadian who live in that country have for that, that job, particularly if it's a regionally created uh, job. That, so that, that kind of movement and the ability to, to learn more. I mean, you know, in the old days when most of us in the region went to UWI or Michael Training College, I think we knew a lot more about each other. These days, so many of our kids now are not going to regional institutions. They're going to schools in the United States, in the United Kingdom and Canada and places. So I think uh, most of the leaders and, and my age group of people 
would have known each other because they would have met at university in Jamaica, on Cayfield, Barbados, uh, I mean, in, in uh, Trinidad. Uh, but that doesn't happen anymore. So to a large extent, we don't know as much as we used to know. And I think somehow we need to find a way to reacquaint ourselves, because I think that's going to be important for, for the future development of the region. Thank you, sir. The premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands, Washington Mizik, joining us here ahead of the Caribbean Development Bank's Board of Governors meeting coming in June. I'm Julian Rogers. Welcome. I'm Julian Rogers in the Turks and Caicos. We had a chat with the Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands, none other than the Honorable Washington Mizik. He is the current Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, who are due to hold their Governors meeting here in the Turks and Caicos in June. We'll talk to the Premier not only about his role as the leader of the country, but also as that of the President of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank and also the President of the UK Overseas Territory Association. He chairs the rotational position as the political council. He's also the Vice President of the Turks and Caicos branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and a representative of the Turks and Caicos Caribbean Heads of Government Meetings. Of course, for CARICOM, he's also have that role of building the relationship with regional institutions as well. So, we welcome you, sir. Thank you, the pleasure is mine. Welcome you, Turks and Caicos. I'm looking forward to a fantastic time here with the rest of the Caribbean and for the CDB board meeting. Let's talk first, Premier, about the Turks and Caicos. How have you done? Turks and Caicos has done extremely well. I mean, in terms of where we are, and the recognition of the progress that's been made here. Uh, it's all been fairly new. Every, just about everything you see around here is less than 50 years old. So we're basically, can be considered a new kid on the block, if you like. But uh, we've had a, we have a very successful economy. Um, tourism obviously is our uh, main industry. In fact, it is sometimes said that Turks and Caicos is probably the most tourism dependent country in the world next to Macau. And, um, but we've done very well. We've, we have been able to uh, consistently for the better part of the last six years produce a surplus in our um, revenue, government uh, revenue, our budgets. Uh, we have a triple B plus credit rating government have zero debt um, and a very hefty reserve including a sovereign wealth fund. So I think we're doing very well all things considered. You know. As you say that I have to ask you how did you survive COVID? A confluence of, of events or circumstances meant that we pulled through COVID very very good. Uh, we had um, we had uh, assistance from the United Kingdom. Uh, we got the vaccine early. Our population responded quickly. So we ramped up to about 80% of vaccination rate by the end of the summer of 20, uh, would have been 2021, I think it would be. And then of course, the fact that we entered the COVID with significant reserve, we were able to really preserve life and, and livelihood. By of the Turks and Caicos Islands.
please remain standing for the national song. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Firstly, let me apologize for the late start and thank you very much for your patience. Welcome to the 22nd William G. DeMass Memorial Lecture. My name is Camille Taylor. I am head of corporate communications at the Caribbean Development Bank, and I have the privilege of being your master of ceremonies this evening. Kindly allow me to acknowledge the presence of some very special guests. Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands and Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, the Honorable Charles Washington Missick, and First Lady, Ms. Delphia Russell Missick. Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Philip J. Pierre. Premier of Anguilla, Dr. the Honorable Ellis Webster. Premier of Montserrat, the Honorable Joseph Farrell. Members of the Cabinet of the Turks and Caicos Islands, our special guest and keynote speaker, 
president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akinwumi Adeshina. Members of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, members of the Board of Directors of the CDB, President of the Caribbean Development Bank, Dr. Jean Leon and Ms. Brenda Thomas. CDB's Vice President of Corporate Services and Bank Secretary, Mrs. Yvette Limonia Seal. CDB's Vice President of Operations, Mr. Isaac Solomon. Other members of the senior, other members of the CDB senior leadership team and members of staff, members of the media, all other special guests and friends, and all the persons joining us online, welcome. Now, having duly acknowledged all who are present, I ask that you allow me to absolve all speakers that follow from delivering lengthy salutations. Premier. May I? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I have, I have done the heavy lifting, so everybody who follows on can get right down to business. Now, the William G. DeMass Lecture Series was inaugurated in the year 2000 in honor of our second president, who was renowned internationally for his expertise as an economist. For the past two decades, these lectures have disseminated the ideas of distinguished scholars, practitioners, and professionals on a wide cross-section of development issues and topics of high significance and interest to the region. This year will be no different, and I will ask CDB's Vice President of Operations, Mr. Isaac Solomon, to set the stage for the evening's proceedings. Isaac. Thank you, Camille. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the President, Dr. Hygienius Lian, and staff of the Caribbean Development Bank, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to the 22nd William G. D. Mass Memorial Lecture. This is one of the most highly anticipated events of our 52nd annual meeting. This prestigious event is our annual tribute to our illustrious past president, the late William Gilbert DeMas. He rendered distinguished service to the region serving in several pivotal positions, including Secretary General of CARICOM, Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, and Chancellor of the University of Guyana. This year, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Akinwumi E. Adeshina, President of the African Development Bank Group, an outstanding development economist serving the people of Africa and the world. The African continent and the Caribbean region have a special relationship based on transatlantic connections and shared experiences. While we cooperate through some multilateral and bilateral frameworks, there is much scope for deeper Africa-Caribbean relations on economic social, and other levels. We have many common threads in our fabric, and we will build upon those foundations as we take alliances to another level, bringing together the interests of our respective citizens. The deepening of relations between Africa and the Caribbean, with an emphasis on trade, investment, and financial partnerships, is strongly supported by both CARICOM and the African Union. And to that, I will add the Caribbean Development Bank. While there might may be great geographical distance between AFDB and CDB, we have a shared commitment to meeting the goals of ending poverty in all forms, demonstrating this commitment through different development objectives, such as helping regional and member countries attain inclusive and equitable quality education and bringing gains for the poorest and most vulnerable, especially for women. Like Sub-Saharan Africa, our region's contributions to global greenhouse gas emissions are relatively marginal, and the poor are disproportionately affected by climate change because of living conditions and lack of capacity to adapt to climate extremities. Like AFDB, we are at the forefront 
of stepping up climate change adaptation efforts in the places that we work. We are helping countries deal with their debt issues and advancing regional integration. So, there are many similarities, some of which I've just recounted. What better time is there for us to hear from Dr. Adeshina? We are culturally experiencing increased geopolitical tensions, surges in inflation, increasing energy costs, and the future of our region is severely threatened. While much of AFDB's work is highly context-specific to changing the lives and futures of Africans, cognizant of the major common commonalities, we are confident that we can learn from each other. Under Dr. Deshina's leadership, the AFDB charges forward with its transformation agenda through high, its high five strategy to support Africa's, African countries' achievement of the SDGs. Heralded as game changing, the high five areas feed Africa, light up Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa, and improve the quality of life for the people of Africa. This is coupled with the Boost Investment Program a major engine to promote and accelerate social and economic development on the continent. These are highly ambitious goals, and like our experience in the Caribbean, they too are contending with external pressures. We believe that concerted action will make things happen, and we look forward to the lessons from the AFDB's experience in driving changes to address complex challenges facing the continent and the world that will be shared this evening. I have no doubt that we stand at the threshold of a powerful experience. In fact, I predict that this will be a most meaningful and memorable addition to the William Gidimas Lecture Series. Dr. Adesina's address on development in a context of global challenges, experiences and lessons from the African continent, African Development Bank, I'm sorry, We'll start the conversation, when, and when we open the floor for your interventions, we encourage you to seize the moment to engage with him. So, people, get ready as we prepare for takeoff. Please ensure that your seat is upright, <laughs> and your armrest is down. Please throw away your phones, if you still have them with you. We hope you have a very relaxing and, and enjoyable evening. Once again, Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, ever since Dr. Adishina accepted our invitation, there has been tremendous excitement and anticipation about this lecture. Finally, the moment is at hand. Our speaker is a globally renowned economist and agricultural development expert, credited with having a transformative impact on almost all the entities and initiatives under his leadership. He served as Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria from 2011 to 2015 and modernized the sector through innovations, including the use of mobile technology and monetary systems. He was first elected president of the African Development Bank Group in 2015, and in 2020, he received 100% of the vote for re-election. Under his leadership, the African Development Bank Group achieved its highest capital increase in 2019, when shareholders raised general capital from $93 billion to a historic $208 billion. He has been recognized with numerous awards, including the World Food Prize in 2017, the 2020 Distinguished Fellowship Award from the West African Institute of Public Health for his efforts to curb the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. And he was named African of the Year in 2019 by one million readers of African Leadership Magazine. Our CDB president, Dr. Jean Leon said, while there is a historic link between the Caribbean and Africa, we must now seek to forge economic linkages and development partnerships to build the economies and societies of both the region and the continent, and also to learn from each other. 
And we look forward to being both guided and inspired by what Dr. Adishna has to share. Ladies and gentlemen, I will delay the moment no longer. It is a privilege and an honor to welcome to the podium the bold reformer, the transformative leader, our brother, Dr. Akinwumi Adishna. Well, thank you very much, my sister. That is very nice. And when I do decide to uh, campaign for political office, <laughs> I certainly will make sure that I call you to make reintroduction. Uh, it might bring me a lot of luck uh, and stuff. So, and it's so nice to be here, you know. And when you also get introduced by a vice president of the bank who actually doubles as a pilot uh, on a plane. Uh, I didn't realize that is uh, some of the criteria you use in selecting your vice president. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, your Excellency, the Premier, uh, for talks and Kaikos, Honorable Charles Washington Messick, the First Lady, Mrs. Deltia Russell Messick, the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the President, my dear brother, twin brother uh, of the Caribbean Development Bank, uh, Jean Leon, and your beautiful wife, uh, Mrs. Brenda Thomas, the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, the Board of Directors of the Caribbean Development Bank, shareholders of the bank, Vice Presidents of the bank, Senior Management of Staff of the bank, of course my own delegation that welcomed me here, friends of the African Development Bank that are here with me, and friends of the Caribbean. We are. It's really great to be here tonight. You know, when you were playing the national anthem, I had to keep myself steady because the uh, Tox and Kaikos national anthem was pretty groovy. And I, I had to make sure I could stand straight. Um, but I can tell you, I certainly will come back to um, uh, Tox and Kaikos, but especially to come back and sing that national anthem. <laughs> I am delighted to be here today at the annual meetings of the Caribbean Development Bank during the 52nd meeting of the Board of Governors of the bank. I wish to thank you, my dear brother and colleague, Dr. Hygienius Jean Leon, President of the Caribbean Development Bank, for inviting me to deliver this lecture today. Of course, Jean and I go way back when he was the country director of the International Monetary Fund in Nigeria. And I was the Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria. We worked so well together. At the start of this 22nd William G. Demers Memorial Lecture, I wish to pay a special tribute to the late Dr. William Demers, the son of Trinidad and Tobago, and the first Secretary General of the Caribbean community, whose illustrious name this lecture bears. Dr. Lemus Demers legacy is a true and shiny example of the excellence for which the Caribbean is renowned. He was an exceptionally strong champion for development, integration, and regionalization. Today, almost 25 years after his passing, he continues to be an inspiration to all of us. It is indeed this inspiration that brought me here today. When I was given the invitation to address you today, I did not hesitate at all to accept for three reasons. First, the hopes and aspirations of the peoples of the Caribbean are the same as those of the peoples of Africa. Our history is linked by a common heritage. Separated, yes, we are by distance, but close we are in lineage desire, hope, and aspiration. Second, I love to sing, and I love to listen to music from the Caribbean. For those of you that might have actually watched the annual meetings of the African Development Bank three weeks ago, I actually sang Jimmy Cleaves, I Can See It Clearly Now, <laughs> which I sang to all the participants at the close of our annual meetings of the African Development Bank. 
And of course, the Secretary General of the Bank was very quick to remind everybody that the President was preparing for his second career after being President of the African Development Bank. Without any doubt at all, the people of the Caribbean have the grooves, the moves, and the clarity of sight. After all, that is what visionary leadership is all about. The capacity to bring the future to the present long before others do. And third, because I see a great opportunity to deepen development ties between Africa and the Caribbean through new strategic partnership between the African Development Bank and the Caribbean Development Bank. The William G. Demers Memorial Lecture is therefore a perfect platform to share our mutual experiences and to trace pathways for a much closer partnership between Caribbean region and Africa. The title therefore of my lecture tonight is Development in the Context of Global Challenges, Experiences and Lessons from the African Development Bank. For this lecture, I will start with sharing with you our focus at the African Development Bank. I will then go through seven global challenges facing Africa's development as much as the Caribbean region, including the following, the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, renewable energy and energy transition, food insecurity and the Russian war in Ukraine, infrastructure, debt and resource mobilization, and growth for youth and women. I will try to draw lessons from my experiences in tackling these challenges for the Caribbean region. Your Excellencies, dear friends, when I was first elected as president of the African Development Bank in 2015, I determined that we must accelerate the development of Africa. You see, I come from a poor and humble background, and so I know that poverty is not pretty. As far as I'm concerned, the most important part of the African Development Bank is not the bank part. It is the development part. I am impatient for accelerated development of Africa. Therefore, the impact of the African Development Bank must be felt in the lives and livelihoods of people. We may not see them, but we must feel them. Their voices may not be in our boardrooms, but we must hear the echoes of their needs, of their needs in the day-to-day -day work and operations of the bank. We do not work for ourselves, we work for them. This is what led me to launch a sharply focused vision and strategy for the African Development Bank, which we call the High Fives, Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa, Industrialize Africa, Integrate Africa, and Improve the Quality of Life of the People of Africa. I wanted the work of the bank to be easily measurable in terms of its impact on the lives of people. After all, I learned from my experience as Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, where I successfully transformed agriculture of the country and ran reforms that impacted the lives of 15 million farmers in just four years. I learned that focus determines results. The more focused you approach, the better your results. You cannot measure what you have not achieved. In just six years, the High Fives has delivered impressive results for the African Development Bank in Africa, improving lives of 335 million people. Close to 21 million people have gained access to electricity. Nearly 76 million people have benefited from agricultural technologies for food security. More than 12 million people have gained access to finance through investing companies that we invest in. Over 69 million people have gained access to improved transport services. 
and 50 million people have gained access to improve water and sanitation. The high fives have since become the accelerators of Agenda 2063 in Africa, but something the African Union calls Agenda 2063, which is the Africa we want. So this has become the accelerators of that Agenda 2063. There was an independent analysis done by the United Nations Development Program. And they look at the high fives and look at the association between that and the Agenda 2063 and the Sustainable Development Goals. And what did they find? They found that if Africa achieves the high fives, it will have achieved 90% of the Agenda 2063. If Africa achieved the high fives, it will have achieved 90% again of the Sustainable Development Goals. Your Excellences, dear friends, the Africa we want is suddenly well within our reach. Over the past decade, African economies were cruising. Six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world are actually were in Africa. Poverty declined gradually. Great progress was being made in times of increase in foreign direct investment. Then COVID struck. Upending growth and the development of gains. COVID devastated economies all around the world. Lockdowns, disrupted global manufacturing, restricted travel, constricted tourism, resulted in declines in commodity prices. The end result was a downward global economic spiral. Africa alone witnessed a decline of our GDP by minus 1.6% the lowest growth in more than two decades. Over 29 million people fell into extreme poverty, and over 30 million jobs were lost. As economic growth and revenues declined for governments, the increased expenditure on health led to rapid growth in fiscal deficits. To rapidly support countries, the African Development Bank approved a crisis response facility of up to 10 billion US dollars to fight this pandemic and to provide positive net financial outflows to countries. The bank also launched a $3 billion social impact bond on the global capital markets, which at the time that we launched it was the largest ever social bond ever launched in world history. Growth in Africa has recovered to 6.9% in terms of GDP growth for 2021. And I'm delighted to note, Jean, that according to your bank, the GDP growth in the Caribbean region is estimated to recover to 9.1% in 2022. But we all must collectively learn a number of lessons from COVID-19. And so let me share with you some of the lessons that we have learned. First is the importance of global cooperation and solidarity in solving problems. It is great credit to the global scientific community that it took just 327 days to rapidly sequence the SARS-CoV-2 and develop the vaccines. Second, the over-concentration of supplies or manufacturing of anything is bad for the global economy as it creates and perpetuates inequities and inequalities. There is clearly a divergence between rich and poorer countries in terms of access to vaccines and therefore the speed of recovery of normal economic activities, including the removal of travel restrictions and the normalization of economic activities. The global system of COVAX designed to provide vaccines for the developing countries failed the developing countries. The vaccination rate in low-income developing countries is only 16%, compared to 80% for developed countries. While the developed economies are coasting to economic recovery on the back of booster shots, African countries, as well as countries in the Caribbean and in other low-income developing countries, were struggling to get basic shots. The director of the Pan-American Health Organization, PHO, Carissa Etienne, stated, and I quote her, 
out of the 13 countries and territories in the Americas that have not yet reached WHO's 2021 goal of 40% vaccination rate, 10 are in the Caribbean. Third, vaccine nationalism has taught us that sovereignty is important. Europe went for vaccine sovereignty. United States went for vaccine sovereignty. Japan put in place vaccine sovereignty. Africa, and of course the Caribbean, should no longer outsource their health security to the benevolence of others. In the case of Africa, we determined that health security for 1.3 billion Africans will no longer be outsourced to the benevolence of others, what if the others are not so benevolent? And neither, I believe, should the Caribbean. Africa must and will secure the health of Africans and prepare for the next health pandemic by putting in place health security defense systems, which includes, one, revamping Africa's pharmaceutical industry. Two, building Africa's local vaccines manufacturing capacity. And three, strengthening Africa's healthcare infrastructure. The ability of developing countries to manufacture their own vaccines continues to face, however, serious challenges. As developed economies block the waiver of intellectual property rights that will make it easier to manufacture vaccines, tests, and treatments, as well as speed up technology transfer. You can see that in the impasse of the World Trade Organization at the World Trade Organization on the trade related intellectual property rights, which endangers the lives at the expense of profits of pharmaceutical companies. A press release by Oxfam on June 8, 2022, beamed a headline as follows Nearly 300,000 people have died every day from COVID-19 since WTO talks on vaccine intellectual property rights began. We must level the playing field and ensure access to intellectual property rights related technologies, knowledge, and processes for developing countries. And that is why the African Development Bank has developed what we call African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation to provide intellectual property rights protection to pharmaceutical companies to deliver vaccines manufacturing technology, knowledge and processes to advance the work of pharmaceutical companies in Africa. The approval of our board of directors of our quality healthcare infrastructure strategy was also timely, responsive, and pragmatic. Therefore, quality healthcare infrastructure will form part of our next 10-year strategy. The bank will partner with other players, bilateral and multilateral, and the World Health Organization, and the African Centers for Disease Control. Your Excellencies and their friends. As we deal with the health pandemic, we must also confront the global challenge of climate change. Climate change poses the greatest threat to the growth and development of developing countries. You feel it right here in the Caribbean, where extreme weather patterns from floods, cyclones, hurricanes, and droughts have destroyed the lives and decimated economies. And we could see that from the period between 1970 and 2016, especially when Caribbean countries suffered losses totaling $22 billion from climate-related disasters. Annual disaster losses in the Caribbean are now estimated to be over $3 billion a year. Now, these small island states are especially highly vulnerable. Not only are lives lost, livelihoods are destroyed, while expensive infrastructure are destroyed, worsening economic growth and competitiveness of the countries. In the case of my continent, Africa, it is the least contributor to climate change in the world, accounting for only 4% of 
of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Yet, the continent suffers disproportionately from the negative impacts of climate change, including increased frequency and intensity of droughts, cyclones, floods compounded by desertification. Climate change is simply shortchanging African economies and also Caribbean economies as it is shortchanging all developing economies around the world. In the case of Africa, the continent suffers seven to $15 billion per year in climate change losses, which are projected to rise to $40 billion by 2030. Africa has absolutely no choice but to adapt to climate change. And to support the continent to do that, the bank has doubled its climate finance to $25 billion by 2025. Without any doubt, today we are the leaders, not only on, in Africa, but globally, when it comes to issue of climate adaptation. The share of our climate finance dedicated to adaptation now is 67%. That's the highest among all multilateral development banks. And the other thing to note is that the bank is also in partnership with the Global Center for Adaptation. We've launched what is called the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. The goal of mobilizing $25 billion in climate adaptation financing for Africa. The African Development Bank is also supporting countries to ensure themselves against extreme weather events through what we call Africa Disaster Risk Insurance Facility. Today, this facility is helping nine countries to pay for insurance premiums to protect themselves from the effects of climate change. In Madagascar, for example, our support of $4 million helped to pay for the full insurance for the country, which allowed them to get $12 million in payouts to compensate over 600,000 farmers when Cyclone Bastriai hit the country. Ladies and gentlemen, we need more financing to ensure many more low-income countries. As we now look towards COP27 in Marrakesh, Egypt, the developed countries must now translate promises into action. And they must translate climate exhortations into climate monetization. The promise $100 billion annually from developed countries to developing countries must be met. My late mentor, Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, he used to tell me, Akin, the only promises that matter are the promises that are kept. Your Excellencies, Nowhere is the challenge for climate change more seriously felt than in the agricultural sector. Africa suffers from high frequencies of floods, droughts, local swamps that are devastating food production systems. The African Development Bank is therefore leading on securing Africa's food supplies in the face of climate change. Six years ago, I launched what's called the Fit Africa Strategy of the bank. Our goal was to deliver climate resilient agricultural technologies at scale for millions of farmers across Africa. And I'm delighted to tell you tonight that we are achieving incredible success. Our Feed Africa work has already benefited over 76 million farmers with access to improved agricultural technologies. Our flagship program that's called Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, the abbreviation for that is TAAT, has delivered climate smart seeds for 12 million farmers in 27 countries in just two years. We are helping farmers to beat climate change. TAT delivered water efficient maize to 5.6 million households, that is 22.4 million people in East Africa an area hit by severe droughts just three years ago. The drought was severe, but the farmers secured their food supply with water-efficient maize varieties. 
In Sudan, TAT financed the provision of 65,000 metric tons of heat tolerant wheat varieties. And you know that wheat is a temperate crop. And so the wheat I'm talking about is not a temperate wheat, it's actually a heat tolerant tropical wheat variety. We provided 65,000 metric tons of that for farmers in Sudan. Ladies and gentlemen, just to make it easier for you to have an idea of what that is, Captain Vice President, Do you fly an A380 aircraft? <laughs> Not yet. You're keeping your seat belt on. If you take an Airbus 380 aircraft, which is the largest Airbus uh, aircraft that you have, passenger aircraft, if you look at the passengers, you look at the fuel, and you look at the cargo that you have, it's 98.4 metric tons. So when I say to you, 65,000, metric tons of certified seed. What I mean by that is the equivalent of 665 Airbus 380 aircraft on a landing strip, just to imagine what that is. That's how much seed we were able to give that country. And in just two seasons, they reduced their wheat import by 50%. We did the same for Ethiopia. We gave them 61,000 metric tons of seed of the same heat tolerant wheat varieties. The farmers cultivated, they started 5,000 hectares in 2018. By 2019, they went to 67,000 hectares. And by this year, they, I thought they were at 400,000 hectares. So I was three weeks ago in Ethiopia, and I was given a honorary doctorate by the Addis Ababa University. So I had lunch with the Prime Minister Abe of Ethiopia. And I was so excited to tell him that the heat tolerant wheat varieties are now cultivated on 400,000 hectares. And he looked at me intently, and I was wondering why. And then he said, Akin, do you know why I was looking at you so intently? I said, no. He said, I was waiting for you to finish because I want to tell you the new real story about it. And I quote him. He said, Ethiopia's wheat production is now on 650,000 hectares. He said, we have harvested 2.6 million metric tons of wheat. And importantly, he said, Ethiopia did not import wheat this year for the first time in the history of the country. He said, Next year, we will cultivate 2 million hectares on the wheat. We expect to export at least 1.5 to 2 million metric tons of wheat to Kenya and to Djibouti. Just imagine all of that in a very, very short period of time. It's simply incredible. Your Excellencies, their colleagues in France, to tackle the looming food crisis now in Africa, arising from Russia's war in Ukraine, the African Development Bank and the African Union Commission developed an African Emergency Food Production Plan. It's a $1.5 billion plan that will be used to allow Africa to produce food rapidly. And this is important. When you take a look at the small country like Ukraine, in fact, it supplies 31% of all the maize to Africa. It was incredible. If you look at East Africa, about 89% of their food supply for wheat is actually coming from Russia and, and Ukraine. And we got 400 million hectares of savanna land in Africa. So what Africa does with agriculture is actually going to determine the future of food in the world. But this particular problem means that Africa will not get 30 million metric tons of food that it was importing from Russia and Ukraine. It will also lose 2 million metric tons of fertilizers that it was importing from those countries. So basically, what we decided to do is to launch this $1.5 billion plan that will allow Africa to produce 38 million metric tons of food, which is more than the 30 million metric tons that it is losing. It will produce a lot of food, which will include uh, wheat, maize, rice, and soybean. And the total value of that food production would be $12 billion. So you're spending $1.5 billion to actually produce food what 
uh, $12 billion. And that's a leverage factor of eight times. And that's what we all do as multilateral developing banks. I think we are leveraging machines. We can actually leverage our resources to accelerate development. And I'm delighted that our board of directors approved this. But I called for a meeting because as a World Food Prize winner, and also as somebody who has the forefront of agriculture globally, I thought it was time for us to wake up and feed ourselves. Because it's time, I believe, for food sovereignty. That applies to you right here in the Caribbean. Gene, I read a recent survey of the CARICOM and the World Food Program that shows that food insecurity has increased by 72% among the population of the English-speaking Caribbean countries. And that across the Caribbean, close to 40% of the population are food insecure, and that's about 2.8 million people. Your Excellencies, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, food aid cannot feed Africa. Food aid cannot feed the Caribbean. Africa and the Caribbean do not need bowls in hands. Africa and the Caribbean need seeds in the ground and mechanical harvesters <laughs> to have as bountiful food produced locally. There is no dignity in begging for food. Your Excellencies, whether it is agriculture, for agriculture or for industry, no economy can develop without access to electricity. In fact, it's so true that when God created the heavens and the earth, the first thing he said was, let there be light, and there was light. And that's why we actually started by saying the first thing for the bank is, let's light up and power Africa. Today we are investing heavily in renewable energy. The largest concentrated solar power plant in the world, which is found in Morocco, is called Nur Wazazate, was invested in by the African Development Bank. If you look at the Bemban solar power project in Egypt, which should be about 3,000 megawatts of solar, was financed by the African Development Bank and Africa 50. Today, we are invested in what's called desert to power. The desert to power is to create the world's largest solar zone that will take the power of solar and develop 10,000 megawatts of solar zone all across 11 countries of the Sahel. And I want to tell you a little bit of story on this one. I went to Chad, the late president of Chad, which is the uh, Idris Deby, the late um, uh, uh, Field Marshal Deby. And when I arrived at the airport, he sent his Minister of Finance to meet me at the airport. And um, so when he came, the temperature was 48 degrees. So I very quickly ran into the car. And I left him stranded on the tarmac. And when he entered the car, he said, Mr. President, you left me stranded, standing by. And I said, well, you know, you're used to this. Uh, I wasn't about to have a cardiac arrest. <laughs> and so we went, and, and when I got to the meeting with the ambassadors of the country, I asked them, what is the electrification rate in Chad? And they told me 8%. I'm like, OK, this is a problem I've got to solve. So I went straight to the president. When I arrived there, I said, Mr. President, they tell me that the electrification rate here is 8%. He said, before I talk to you about that, why did you leave my minister? <laughs> Stranded, I mean, standing there, I said, Mr. President, I didn't want to die because I'm president of the African Development Bank. That's a key person risk. <laughs> so so I, I got to make sure I stay alive. So I went quickly into the car. But I said, but I want to find out, what is the electrification rate? I said, they tell me it's 8%. He looked at me, and he said, who's been lying to you? He said, it is not 8%, it is 2%. And so I told him, Mr. President, you know, the judgment day is going to be quite serious. If God gave us all that light and burns your skin, but you can't power your homes, how do you say that? I said, therefore, Mr. President, I advise you to make it compulsory for all households
to have access to solar PV in their homes, remove all taxes on import, on installation, and maintenance of all your solar systems in the country, and you will get 100% access to electricity. Interestingly, within 15 minutes of my telling him that, he made that decision. And within two weeks, they turned it into a law. And so all I'm trying to say is, we've got to be at the front end of using what God has given us and turning that into power. So let there be light, but let there be light. And I want to say that I applaud the efforts being made in the Caribbean region in this area of renewable energy. I see the 50 megawatts El Soco solar farm. That's worth $90 million. And many of this is financed by the Caribbean Development Bank. The Barbados plan to construct this year a $25 million 10 megawatt solar power plant in the mangrove uh, St. Philip, using wave energy to develop 40 megawatts ocean commercial power park to Jamaica's plans to develop electric car charging stations, and the microgrid energy systems being developed by the British Virgin Islands. So I applaud those efforts. I also want to applaud the, the region for the Caribbean Infrastructure Forum, which I think is a great idea, as it brings together investors to finance infrastructure projects across the region. Other financiers, such as the European Investment Bank, they also have facilities for the Caribbean including Caribbean Investment Facility of the EIB, which has so far mobilized $1.13 billion or euros since it was launched in 2010. Your Excellences, as we look at global energy transition, which is what everybody is talking about today, I would like to say that we must have four imperatives. The first is that we must ensure access and affordability of electricity. The second is that there must be security of supply of electricity. Third, gas, natural gas, must remain a critical part of the energy mix for Africa. When this issue is raised, some people, well, you know, say, well, you're going to really create a lot more problems in times of um, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions. Oh, really? Well, in fact, if Africa uses and triples all the natural gas it has for power generation, you know how much it will have contributed to, green, uh, to uh, new carbon emissions? Less than 0.67%. So here's what I'm saying. You are in an economy where you have tourism. So you know about cruise ships. They come all the time. Now, if you are on a cruise ship, how many of you have been on cruise ships in this area? Really? You all live on cruise ships, yeah. You can move from one room to the other. You can play all kinds of games on your cruise ship. And everything is steady, because you move from a steady place to another one. That is energy transition for developed countries. Everything is stable. You just switch from one thing to the other, but it's stable. Now, let me give you what it looks like for a developing country, particularly in Africa, and I'm sure also for you guys. You know, a little rickety boat where you try to row from one side to the other, if you move too fast from this side to that side, you're going to flip right over. So we are not in the same boat. And all developing countries want to have as much as we want to do renewable energy. For us at the bank, 87% of our investment in energy generation is in renewable energy. But there are limits. We must have stability of the grid to allow developing countries to be able to uh, develop. And therefore, we've got to really bear this in mind. Now, the issue of just energy transition is so important that we must realize that achieving net zero emission is important. Well, we cannot get net zero emission with zero financing. And that's why the African Development Bank is supporting South Africa. And I want to see the G7 countries here. I see Canada, I know there are other, Britain is here, UK, 
or working with South Africa for an $8.5 billion facility for its just energy transition. But in fact, what South Africa needs is $40 billion. And so what we are doing at the African Development Bank is to work with the G7 countries with a financial model that will allow South Africa to leverage the grants, the concession of financing, and the guarantees that are provided by the G7 to actually mobilize $40 billion for South Africa to do its just energy transition. And I'll point this out. We're going to be able to allow it to do that without getting into debt at all. And I think that's most important for us when we actually do just energy transition. Let me go into a little bit of what we are doing on infrastructure. Today, the African Development Bank is the largest financier of infrastructure in Africa. Over the last six years, we've invested over $44 billion in infrastructure alone. 50% of that is in transport, energy, and water. Some of this include the Nakala Rail and Road Corridor, linking Malawi, Zambia, and Mozambique, boosting trade and providing access to the sea for landlocked countries and reducing transport costs by as much as 15 to 25 percent. The Kazungula Bridge project is connecting Botswana, Zambia, Namibia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's led to a reduction in waiting time from 14 days to just one hour. The Senegambia Bridge that connects the two countries has reduced the cost of crossing between the two countries by 50 percent. The Addis Ababa Nairobi Corridor, linking Ethiopia and Kenya, which we financed with $1.1 billion, has allowed trade between both countries to expand by 400%. And we've also invested heavily in ports to expand trade logistics and to enhance competitiveness within the Africa continental free trade areas. But as I look at this, I think of my last two days here. I've been talking to the president of the Caribbean Development Bank. I've been talking to the vice president. I've been talking to the premier, all about infrastructure. And the question really is, what are some of the lessons that one can offer in terms of infrastructure financing? I'll go through maybe a few of them. One is that the most critical thing for infrastructure is developing bankable projects. So having the facility in place for the Caribbean Development Bank to be able to develop bankable infrastructure projects is the way to do it. At the African Development Bank, we have a facility that's called the NEPAD Infrastructure Project Preparation Facility. We've used that to mobilize over $25 billion in downstream infrastructure just because we have the project preparation facility. The second is the importance of the pension funds, the institutional investors, the pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds, they all hold assets under management well over $103 uh, trillion. So when we talk about fixing infrastructure in the Caribbean or fixing infrastructure in Africa, 0.001% of the assets under management, it's enough to fix all that problem. So how we work with institutional investors, it's very, very important. I also think that we need to deploy better the way that we finance infrastructure by ensuring efficiency of public financing for infrastructure. A lot of the problems we have in infrastructure is actually very bad and corrupt procurement systems that actually add to the length of the process but also the cost of financing uh, infrastructure. I see that some of you are laughing on that. Maybe there's something that I don't know. Yeah. The fourth area, of course, is to make sure we have public-private partnerships in financing infrastructure. The fifth area I think that we need to do a lot more is in mobilizing green infrastructure. For example, Africa's share of global green bonds is only 0.4%. I don't know what yours is, Gene, in this part of the world. But there's so much money around for green financing, and I think being able to, uh, to, 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 to optimize that it's very, very important, and that's why the African Development Bank launched what's called Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa to be able to tap into green bonds and green financing for Africa. 
The sixth area is, of course, reducing the risk of investment in infrastructure, whether it's project risk, market risk, whether it is uh, political risk or operational risk. Instruments that allow you to be able to uh, do risk is very, very important. The seventh, of course, is sweating our balance sheet. Basically, making sure that we can get more out of the little money we have. So, for example, UK is here. I, uh, I, where's UK? I thought I saw UK. Yeah, you're right over there. Uh, you can tell my dear friend, uh, Minister Vicky Ford, uh, that she's done a great job for us uh, because the FCDO gave us um, a guarantee facility that allows us to free up $2 billion out of our, our headroom to do more on the infrastructure. Just imagine what that does. And I would like to encourage you to please do that for my brother here. Uh, at the <laughs> You know, and, and, and I, you know, I, I, I just, I really like very much Minister Vicky Ford. She's a, she's a very tough negotiator, so you should get ready. Um, uh, we, we were at the World Bank annual meetings, and I was at the White House uh, having meetings, and I, I had to go see her, and I, we were zooming right through Washington, D.C., and we, are, we were late for about two minutes. And I entered the room, the Minister Vicky Ford said, well, you know, President Adesino, that would be $2 billion. Uh, <laughs> And, and of course, being an economist, and I say, well, I actually bought myself a risk guarantee facility before arriving here. <laughs> so all that just to say thank you very much to the UK government and also to others that are doing similar things. I think we should do this to allow us to do more with the little money that we, amount of money that we have. And finally is infrastructure that you finance with foreign currency, but the revenue streams are in local currency. You have a currency mismatch problem. And so doing a lot more in local currency financing, I think, is fundamental for us to being able to finance infrastructure. Let me now turn to the issue of debt, which I think it's very fundamental for all of us as multilateral development banks. If you look at today the debt to GDP ratio in Africa, it has risen to 70%. When I look at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, on debt to GDP ratio of the Caribbean countries, it has risen average to 85%. The number of Caribbean countries with debt to GDP ratio of over 60% increased from 9 to 13 due to this pandemic. So basically, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in the Caribbean, you cannot run up a hill carrying a backpack full of sand. And so it's important to actually have debt relief, to have debt restructuring, but we must have debt sustainability. And what is particularly worrying for me in the case of Africa is the structure of the debt. I mean, bro, you, you are from the IMF before you got here, and so you know the history very well. The bulk of Africa's debt used to be concessional finance. Today, the bulk of it is private creditors, commercial financing, which is very, very expensive debt to have. But we have the International Monetary Fund's issuance of the special drawing rights of $650 billion. So I want to commend IMF for that. But Africa got only $33 billion of that. The Caribbean actually got $2.5 billion uh, of that. I know that President Gene has been talking about the challenge with so many small countries with a high degree of vulnerabilities to external shocks and with all these needs and that the best way to do this is to pull the SDRs for the region to be able to leverage this in times of greater borrowing from the international capital markets. A proposal that he's been pushing and I want to say I really endorse that proposal. It really makes a lot of sense. You should clap for him. <laughs> and just make sure that all the SDRs don't leave the room before you go. <laughs> now, I want to make a few points because we have shareholders that are here and um, uh, countries from developed countries that actually have these SDRs. A couple of points I want to make is that I think it's time to get some of the SDRs to pass through the multilateral development banks. The IMF has the poverty 
uh, Reduction and Growth uh, Trust. They have the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which we all support. And I think it's great that that is happening. But you all will recall that there was a time when Furman, uh, who was the, the, the former, I mean, he's currently the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, was asked to look at the global financial architecture and how to optimize that. So I am focusing on macroeconomic stabilization and fiscal stabilization. But the multilateral developing banks like ourselves, we actually know sectoral policies and sectoral issues more than anybody else. That is our bread and butter. So I believe that for the following reasons, some of the SDR should go through the multilateral developing banks. First, is that the multilateral developing banks can leverage the special drawing rights. For us at the African Development Bank, every single dollar of special drawing right, we can leverage four times. And that's very important to have. The second that we need to pay attention to is that some of these SDRs can be absorbed as equity for some of these multilateral development banks to be able to expand their lending capacity. And third is that we can also make sure that we provide additional capital and financing to these banks in the Caribbean and across Africa so that they can fund other multi all the banks like a capillary system that you can get a finance into where it is absolutely needed. Now, we have been on the forefront of actually championing this as African Development Bank. As you know, the Islamic Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, and the Asian uh, Development Bank are with us on this. But at the end of the day, what are we trying to do? We're really trying to develop the lives of people. We're trying to transform societies. So I think that instead of SDRs just becoming static instruments that we put on the balance sheet of central banks, why can't we get, we get really creative and maybe take the acronym of the, of the SDRs and maybe we could call it Supporting Development Revitalization. <laughs> and that way the SDR translates an impact in the lives of people that matter on a day to their basis. As I try to draw to a close, I want to talk about areas in which the African Development Bank and the Caribbean Development Bank can work to mobilize investments. We started at the African Development Bank something called the Africa Investment Forum in 2018. Before that, people used to say, well, who is going to invest in Africa? There is risk and risk. And like, well, you know, risk is important. But what's important is how you manage your risk. There's risk everywhere. And I was saying today, you know, how many of you are swimmers? Let me just see. Uh, you all are in this area. You must be swimmers. But, I, but I'm actually not a great swimmer. I, I learned to swim just about four years ago. And the reason why I learned to swim was because I was looking for general capital increase of the bank. And I had to make sure that in case something happened, I wasn't going to have a single man risk and drown. So I say, well, you know, before I start asking donors for uh, general capital increase, I better make sure that if anything happens, I can swim my way out of um, a, 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 you know, a boat or something. So I got a coach who decided to teach me how to swim. And after two days, he put all these baby things on my, <laughs> on my arms, and, and I was feeling really, really embarrassed by it. And so I determined that I was going to really learn how to swim very quickly. That was the incentive. And so after two days, the third day, he said, President, I want you to swim the whole length of the pool. I said, you must be out of your mind. Uh, you really don't want me to have a general capital increase for the bank. And so I decided to do it. And then he said to me, well, you know, if anything goes wrong, I'll be right there behind you. I will pick you up. And just to demonstrate that, he went right into the bottom of the pool. He lay there for about two minutes. I thought he was dead. <laughs> but then he came right up, so I had confidence that he could actually deliver me. So I decided to take a chance, and I started swimming to the other side of the pool. But there was a voice behind me saying, keep going. I'm right there. If anything happens, I'm right there. I'll grab you. And I kept going. And I went to the whole length of the pool. And then I turned behind just to make sure that he was there, that he wasn't there, started sinking. <laughs> and I quickly held onto the rails, and um, 
he was on the other side and he was talking right through the water just for me and all I'm trying to say with that was that I overcame my fears perceived risk is so high that it actually makes you afraid of investing in the Caribbean makes you afraid of investing in Africa so we decided to do that through the Africa investment forum what happened the way we do it and since we're gonna do it together we bring the heads of state all into a room and we tell the heads of state please your excellency no excellencies in a meeting with investors you are chief executive officer of your country business developers project developers financiers and everybody are in the room will be in the room and you have to sell your country 2018 we started the first year we did 38.7 billion dollars of investment interest secured in less than 72 hours 2019 we did $40.1 billion of investment interest commitments to Africa in less than 72 hours. Of course, COVID came and we couldn't really do it. And this year, we did it in March this year, virtually. Even then, we did $32.8 billion. So what I want to say to you is that it's time for us to actually bring the Caribbean and Africa together on cross-investment. And so I've told President Jean that for the Africa Investment Forum, we will now turn part of that to Africa Caribbean Investment Forum that we will use to be able to bring investors to the Caribbean and investors from Caribbean into Africa. That way you can swim confidently that we are in control. And I look forward to President us being able to do that. I think it will be phenomenal uh, between our two, uh, two regions. Now let me talk about women and also youth as I draw this to a close. When I was elected president of the bank, I went to a place in um, Senegal, uh, which is called Gore Island. I don't know if any of you have been to Gore Island. Gore Island was where they took slaves out of Senegal. And when I got over there, there is a door over there that called the door of no return. That's the last place the slaves would go through before they boarded onto the ships. And so you can imagine, as an African, the emotions that I heard. Just been there, just th seven days before I resumed as president of the bank. And as I finished from there, I went back into my car. And as I sat in my car, then the idea, it just hit me. That at that time, they took the slaves, the best of Africa, strong men and women out of Africa, but they took them against their abolition. Well, here we are, young Africa, smart Africa, that I've gone to college, as supposed to be the future of Africa, taking rickety boats, heading to the Mediterranean on their own volition. I put my head on, uh, down on my chair, and I said to myself, no, the future of Africa's youth does not lie in the United States. It does not lie in Canada. It does not lie in the UK. It does not lie in Asia. It does not lie in Latin America. It must lie in an Africa that is growing well, that it has robust, inclusive growth, that is able to create jobs for its youth, because we cannot but turn the demographic asset of the continent into an economic dividend for the continent. And that is what motivated me to actually start what is called, we are designing them right now, they call Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks. This will be new financial institutions that will do nothing but just invest in the businesses of young people. <laughs> you know, as a young person, if you go to a bank, it's somebody like me with a bow tie, and how do you even give me a conversation, right? 
But if you're 21 years old and you enter a bank, they'll ask you, credit history, zero. They ask you, how old are you? You say, 21 years old. They say, please go and bring the last 30 years of your tax payments. <laughs> now, what I want to say about this, President Jean and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, is that these banks are going to be institutions that will finance the businesses of young people in a life cycle model. It's not a spot transaction. You support them through the life cycle of their businesses because we must create youth-based wealth. And we can't do that. We can't do that unless we take a risk on behalf of our young people. Otherwise, the consequences of not doing it. Be serious, we have serious market failures and missing institutions around young people, and we cannot afford to, to have that. Now, let me also now turn to the issue of financing women. I will give you an example of again why or how I made that decision. And sometimes when folks work for you, they don't even know how you made your decision. And so let me be very clear to my staff a little bit why I made that decision. In 1990, 1991, I took off a plane as a young economist to go to Nigeria from Abidjan, from Abidjan to Lagos. And I was coming back from that flight. And I saw so many women on the plane, market women, we call them, market mamas, you know. And they were carrying baskets on their head, all manner of baskets. And I said to myself, how in the world am I going to put my computer into the overhead compartment? There was no, no way in the world. There were so many. And you know those days you had a, comp you know, you know what, had a compact, the old compact computer that looks like a, uh, like a briefcase, like a suitcase. That's all I had. And I was really trying to get it up there. Not saying that for in any derogatory way at all. So I'm like, why are they the same size? In fact, what happened was suddenly they started taking off the bales of clothing. They had actually put bales of clothing around themselves that they were selling because the customs were cheating them. And that was how they got it all in the plane. Of course, in those days, there's no security checks and all these things that we used to have now. So all of them, I found, were the same size. And it's almost like they could actually pass for doing catwalk on Paris or something. And then the, the hostess looked at me and said, sir, can I help you? I said, I'm struggling. I just want to put my stuff up there. And she looked at me and says, how many times do you take this plane? The flight is played. I say it depends on my job. Maybe a month, maybe two. Say, so take a good look at this woman. They may look like illiterate to you, but they fly this aircraft twice a day. And said to me, and said, therefore, sir, give me your luggage. I put it right in the hold and make more room for the women. So when I became president of the African Development Bank, I decided to do that. And that's what led me to create what's called the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, which is to mobilize $5 billion specifically for the businesses of women, make room for the women. Last year, we actually paid out over $434 million to businesses of women in Africa. This year, we will do half a billion dollars of payout to businesses of women in Africa. And why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Our vision is clear. When women win, Africa wins. They will win like Samia Suluhu, the first female president of Tanzania. They will win like Sally Walk Swede, the first female president of Ethiopia. They will win like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first female president of Liberia. They will win like Joyce Bander, the first female president of Malawi. They will win like Amina Gurib Fakim, the first female president of Mauritius. They will win like Mia Amo Motley, the first female prime minister of Barbados. Your Excellencies, 
the African Development Bank as an instrument of transformation, its current development goals for Africa. The African Development Bank was ranked by Global Finance as the best multilateral financial institution in the world in 2021. The African Development Fund was ranked by the Washington-based Center for Global Development as the second best concession of financing institution in the world in terms of development effectiveness ahead of 28 concession of financing institutions in developed countries. And it was pleasing for us that it was also ahead of IDA or the World Bank. Your Excellencies, we will continue to strive to make Africa proud and share our lessons. We will work with our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean to build collective hope. Yeah, man, I love the Caribbean. <laughs> the Caribbean has always energized our world. From reggae music legends Bob Marley, Kido Tosh, to Jimmy Cliff, to legendary Jamaican Usain Bolt sprinter who broke all possible spin records, to the legendary economist, development economist, late Dr. Demers, who continues to inspire us and brings, who brought us together here today again. So let the Caribbean region arise and break records in development. Let us poor accelerate growth and development, for poverty must not become our comparative advantage. Accelerate we must, win we must. As Usain Bolt said, and I quote, Stop waiting for things to happen. Go out and make them happen. The African Development Bank stands ready to work closely with the Caribbean Development Bank. Together, let's go out and make things happen for our peoples. Thank you all very much. So the floor is now open for questions. We're going to ask you, please, if you could just step to the microphone. We want to keep our online audience in mind. So if you could just step to the microphone, if you have a question, that way the camera can pick you up. And those who are joining us via the live stream will be able to, will be able to see you. Dr. Additional, you saw the reaction in the room when you mentioned stamping out corruption. Mm. And under your leadership as Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, 
that was a, a problem that you managed to tackle successfully. What were the lessons learned there and anything that we could apply here, particularly in the area of infrastructure, which you mentioned is a particularly pressing problem? Well, thank you uh, very much. You know, the, the fact of the matter is that if you have thieves that are trying to rob someone, the best way to deal with that, you got two ways of doing it. One is to get a gun and you start shooting. The other way is to just turn on the light. People that do dark things don't like the light. So the key is transparency. The key is making sure, because infrastructure in particular, like you said, it's, it's a sector that tends to be quite easily corrupted. And so in the procurement process, it's easily corrupted. Um, in the sense of how people actually get contracts, it could be easily corrupted. In terms of the pricing of infrastructure, it could be easily corrupted. So I think transparency, accountability, value for money are the things that one must do. Now, of course, every institution, I'm sure like you have, uh, you have an anti-corruption unit that must look into how things are done. So if people actually call corners in one place, then it has to be we have in the multilateral development banks a, a, um, a cross department across from World Bank to everybody else, if you're found to have done something uh, that, is, uh, that is wrong. And I think that should, uh, should continue. But in the case of agriculture, just to give a context of that point that you raised, when I was Chukwa minister in Nigeria, I found that, that only 11% of the, I mean, you were in Nigeria at the time, right? So 11% of the fertilizers procured in, in and distributed by government ever go to farmers. And so I know fertilizers, um, you have NPK fertilizers, but in this case of this particular fertilizer, it has a way of, it has hands and legs and walks away. Uh, uh, it's a specialized fertilizer. And, and so the way that I tried to deal with that was first to get government out of the business that is not government's business. The, the, the business of government is to set good policies, good regulations, and create great incentives. But let the private sector run things, right? And you have to also create competition. It was not easy, but I had to fight it. In fact, I told my wife, I said, honey, look, I've been appointed Minister of Agriculture. 11% of farmers were getting fertilizers. If that continues, I will fail as a Minister of Agriculture. So it's either I fix it, or I resigned, and I decided to fix it. And what we did was basically take the farmers, register them on biometric data, register all the farmers, and then give the subsidies of government, which was highly corrupted, and give it to farmers via their mobile phones. So you cut off all the, all the, all the guys that are actually corrupting the whole system. So if you got your fertilizer and seeds, you will get a voucher saying, 50% of it is paid for by the government. Then you go to the input retailer that is selling it and you use your, you pay 50% cash and then you use your mobile money to pay for that. And this was way in 2011, before blockchain and all those things uh, uh, started. Well, the essence of what I was saying was that we brought transparency into the system and we increased the share of government's fertilizer subsidized that was actually getting to farmers from 11% to 94%. Just by bringing transparency, you modern technology. So I think the issue of technology to fight corruption, is, especially digital technology for transparency and so on, is, uh, it's uh, very, very important. And one thing I will never forget on that, I was talking to the Minister uh, of Agriculture today in the session we had was I went to a particular perimeter, they were doing rice. And there were all these women that were walking, and they were in, in the area where they had security. So they were wearing black powder. So my security staff thought I was in danger um, because of the insecurity in that zone. And, but when the women drew closer, all of a sudden they put their hands in their you know, gar garments and 
They pulled out their mobile phones and they said, Minister, we the women now get our seeds and fertilizers in our villages. Thank you very much for that because now the men cannot cheat us anymore. <laughs> so I think that's how we try to do that. And I stayed alive. <laughs> Well, on, on that note, I, I think you would have also heard the reaction when you spoke about Ethiopia, because many of us remember, particularly in the 1980s, with the famine situation there and the worldwide fundraising, how quickly can that success be replicated with, with what you shared about Ethiopia and the wheat? How quickly can that type of success be replicated in other places on the continent and even elsewhere? Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's very important to always share experiences. Um, sometimes, you know, when people look for what works, we often look to the developed countries for what the lessons are for what works. But we rarely go looking for other developing countries that are very similar to us to see what are their challenges, um, how do they overcome those challenges, and what are the lessons. So I think um, a lot of South-South learning, in my view, is very, very important to, to have. Um, secondly, is that when you're in public policy, you can actually do quite a lot in public policy, but how much of it is actually written down? We're not pretty good at writing down stories and, um, about experiences in, in public policy. So I think actually documenting all these things are very, very uh, important. The third thing, of course, is there's no um, uh, 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 cookie cutter solution. Um, every region, every country, it's very, uh, very, very different. So one has to understand that heterogeneity. However, there are common principles for success. Is a targeted approach, developing, um, I mean, if you're a surgeon, right, and I try to, uh, you know, well, let me, let me not go too much into this because I might get myself into uh, trouble with my son uh, at home. Uh, but I'll come back to that uh, so that you understand what I'm saying. But I do think that you need to have a very focused approach of trying to do something like a surgeon. But what I was trying to say about not getting into trouble with my son, who is in the, a, a physician in the United States, was that I, I really desperately wanted to be a medical doctor uh, when I was a kid. My father wanted me rather to be a medical doctor. And um, he, he, um, at the age of 14, I had, I had um, you know, and this applies to issue of solutions because some of you, today I was with the Minister of Agriculture and I asked everybody who wants to be a farmer and, and everybody kind of looked at me and, and, and I didn't see anybody. But, but here's my story and, 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 and I'll ask you all at the end to see whether I succeed as well uh, with you all here tonight. So my dad wanted me to be a medical doctor. He grew up as a farmer. My grandfather, they earned a penny a day so they couldn't really afford anything. So that's my background. And so when he joined the civil service, he, 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 he moved up and put low, low levels and stuff like that. So at the age of 14, when I finished my high school and I applied to the university, my father filled my forms for me. So the first choice was medicine. And the second choice was uh, veterinary medicine. <laughs> and the third choice was dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> so whether I liked it or not, I was going to be a doctor of some kind. So I took the exam the first year, and they said my marks were just a little bit under. They couldn't take me for medicine. We'll take it for agriculture. But I said, never. <laughs> then I went on to my A-levels, and I started. My first year in A-levels, I took the exams again. They said, oh, you did so well, but you fell short of medicine again. But we'll take you for agriculture. <laughs> and then I finished my advanced level studies, and I applied again. Oh, they said, oh, you fell short. What well, would we'll take you again for agriculture? <laughs> so my father said, God must desperately want you <laughs> in, in, in agriculture. So when I finished um, uh, in my first year in agriculture, I was at the top of my class. So the dean said, well, take this sleep and go to the medical school. They'll take you there because you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> and I went there, but when I got over there, we were trying to rush. And we opened a door, but the door we opened was the door to the cadaver room, <laughs> where they kept the dead bodies. 
And so I said, no, I love living plants than dead people. Um, so I went back to do agriculture. So later on, I went to Purdue University in the US and did my PhD in agricultural economics. So when I graduated, I told my father, I wrote him a letter. I said, doctor, PhD. <laughs> And um, from that time on, my father called me doctor, and I loved it. <laughs> but then our son graduated from medical school, and when he was doing his graduation in the United States, my dad was 90 years old, so we brought him to the United States for this. And, um, and when we were taking pictures, um, he said, doctor, and which was supposed to be me. So I said, yes, dad. He said, no, I don't mean you. I mean the real doctor. <laughs> And, uh, and so I, I called my son and uh, the real doctor uh, and my dad together. I said, Dad, even the real doctor will tell you, take three tablets three times a day, but only after food. <laughs> so which means agriculture is more important than medicine. <laughs> so I, I just want you to know, all of you here tonight, my job is to actually turn you into agriculture, but you can still claim doctors if you want. <laughs> Well, Doctor, uh, you, you told a very interesting, uh, you gave a very interesting explanation um, this morning. Um, Dr. Dishna did an interview and you explained your name. And a kin, a kin actually means the man who can win the war. And I think you were adequately and appropriately <laughs> named. Thank you so very much for delivering your inspiring and informative lecture this evening, and thank you so much thank for you. answering one, the one question. One question. Sorry, <laughs> keep you up there a little bit longer. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. Very inspirational. Um, I am Dr. Holly Hamilton, the Director of Meteorology at the Turks and Caicos Islands Airport Authority. Is your question on medicine? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Um, so, um, in your lecture, you touched on climate change, um, the impact of climate change on the different sectors, and what the African Development Bank did to support those areas. Um, I was just interested to hear a bit about what the African Development Bank did specifically for the area of weather and climate itself, um, in terms of supporting the services, the service providers, the infrastructure, um, because again, with climate change, um, it's important to develop the early warning systems. So I was just interested to hear what Africa Development Bank did um, for that area. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thanks for not asking the question about when you say you are a real doctor. I was getting a bit worried. Um, but actually, what happens is that when we look at climate change today, the issue is we have better technology and better models today to predict weather patterns. We can easily develop what the probability distributions of different states of nature will be. And therefore, having weather stations, it's very, very important. And when you have the weather stations, then you are able to actually determine what it is that the, the actual people will use to, to, to determine how much they can pay out based on probability of loss or things like that. But you know, when I look at when I was in graduate school in the US, the number of weather stations that we had at Purdue University was more than the number of weather stations that many countries had in Africa. So investing in weather climatic infrastructure, I think it's, it's very, very important. The second thing I think is very important is how to actually come up with good insurance products that actually helps the poor farmers and that's affordable for them. And in addition to that is livestock insurance because I don't know about how much of livestock is, very, is important in this area, but if you are like in Kenya, if you are in Tanzania, if you are in Nigeria, if you are in the Chad Republic and any of these countries, livestock is very important. So being able to have uh, livestock insurance is it's really very, very uh, important. And um, talking of, uh, where's the doctor? She was asking me the question. Yeah, you know, just to give you a, pra please sit in there. Uh, just to give you a practical, uh, let me stand up so I can see you. Uh, 
Just to give you a practical example, when I was Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, and um, he was in Nigeria, were you in Nigeria in 2012? Yeah, you remember we had the flood. Yeah, and it was the worst flood in the history of Nigeria. And I was Minister of Agriculture. And going to work, I will look at the newspapers. My driver would tell me, and my security aide would say, you know, they're saying there's going to be um, food crisis. There's going to be hunger in the country. And so I told him, please, do not read newspapers. I said, because noise is not equal data. And discomfort is not the same as statistic. And so what we decided to do was I decided to bring in the International Water Management Institute out of Sri Lanka into Nigeria. And we were buying satellite imagery and remote sensing data over Nigeria. Because everybody was saying there was total chaos. I mean, you were there. It was, it was disaster. And I said I wanted to find out how much of the flooded area in Nigeria was actually arable land. <coughs> and how much of that arable land is cultivated land. And what is the stage of crop growth when the flood actually reaches maximum level? So that you can use uh, vegetation data to determine that. The fact that a crop is inundated doesn't mean it's going to die. It just depends on what the, what the, what the, what the level of the, of the flood really was. And so we divided the country into little, little pixels like this. And we estimated that Nigeria was going to lose roughly about 4, um, uh, 465,000 hectares. You know, but I knew that that's not enough to create a food crisis for the country. But the newspapers were all, um, all over and all of that. Uh, but anyway, at about uh, 10 o'clock on the 5th day, we were in a bunker in my office, buying satellite, NASA images and stuff like that. The president called and said, Akin, please make your way to my office tomorrow because the, the noise about a food crisis was too, 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 too loud. So the good thing was he was actually a marine biologist. So I took all my uh, remote sensing data, everything, and I got out of them and came to the president's office. And I laid them on his table. And I walked him right through every single thing. And he said, really? I said, yes, because data matters. The ability to get that data, the analytical information matters. And then he said, so what are we going to do about it? I said, Mr. President, you didn't ask for the flood. But you can have a solution. You see, God is good in every single situation. I said, the water that you see is receding. That's free irrigation. And what you do is that you just follow the water and plant as the water recedes. The topsoil is rich. It's gathered everything from everywhere. It's very, very, you don't need fertilizers. And that's how Nigeria started its first national dry season farming program to produce food in the middle of a crisis. <coughs> and we started planting in November. I told the president by, Jan uh, by March, you just watch what's going to happen. By March, when the harvest of wheat and maize was coming out, the price of food fell in Nigeria. He was there. For the first time, we had the worst flood in the history of the country. But we were able to recover because we use science, because we use knowledge, because you, you use the information technology to allow decision making. So that's why I think that we should inv uh, do a lot of early warning system infrastructure that you talked about, the analytical capacity to interpret data, train people in climatologies, car sciences, and stuff like that. Because the reality is we're going to keep having this issue of climate change, but we must be able to be prepared to be able to uh, deal with it. So that's how we try to do that. Good evening, doctor. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask you the real doctor question, but uh, <laughs> we, after you sing Jimmy Cliff, I thought you would end with that. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm basically Ellis Webster from Anguilla. And um, there are a couple. Okay, <laughs> a real one. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Or, um, one is uh, to start with you mentioned that Africa, the 
uh, debt to GDP was 70 percent. And we have here in our region where we have to meet the goal, the threshold of debt to GDP of 60 percent uh, by 2030. Now it was just extended 2035 in the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank area. Um, the concern is I always feel that uh, that is restrictive in the sense that it forces everyone into the same threshold when different countries have different vulnerability, have different economies, and certainly in this age of natural disasters like we had Hurricane Irma in 2017 and the pandemic 2020, 21, 22, maybe 23, 24. Um, and tourism accounts for 85% of our economy. How do we expect, or how does your system expect us to survive if we have to be constricted into these, um, this mm -hmm. threshold? Also, you know, we are a, a UK overseas territory, and so we have borrowing guidelines and are restricted in terms of our borrowing that we have to be, can only borrow about 80% of our recurrent revenue, and we are right now at about 170 percent of that. So, it, <laughs> with our, uh, you know, debt service supposed to be 10 percent, and we are at 21 percent, and our reserves, which are supposed to be at 25 percent of our um, recurrent expenditure, is one day's amount. And uh, you know, so so it just puts us in a in, in a in a box. And so then when we talk about development, how do we as a small um, island uh, developing state survive with when we expected to meet these standards? And the second thing is, you know, in terms of um, you know, the Africa Development Bank, um, you know, I like the models that you talked about, the renewable energy things, but we more hear about, um, you're not selling yourself, because we hear that the Chinese own Africa because they're doing all the infrastructure work. And you showed some beautiful bridges and, and um, roads and stuff. We never hear that, uh, you know, that those that you are developing the people, we hear that the Chinese have moved in and taken over the country. So if you could just, uh, you know, expound on those, uh, please. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Real Doctor, uh, for that. Uh, yeah, you know, first on the issue of debt to GDP ratio that, that you mentioned. Um, you know, a number of things that we received in how we measure economic growth, performance, um, and viability or sustainability of financing for countries are based on what I think old models. And I think those things need to be relooked at. For example, when you look at um, the Caribbean from 1970 to, to uh, 2016, it's lost $22 billion to shocks, as I said in my, in my lecture, to droughts, to floods, to cyclones, and all of that. That's not of their own doing, right? Um, the Caribbean doesn't contribute nothing to global greenhouse gas emissions. But like Africa suffers disproportionately from the negative consequences of that. And so when you are actually using money to actually cope, to rebuild infrastructure that's damaged by things that you didn't cause, I think then the way in which we measure this freedom of headroom for countries needs to take that into consideration. So basically, which means that if you're looking at vulnerability, my expenditures to compensate for what I didn't cause shouldn't be part of my debt. That's my first point. The second point that I want to say is, not only for that, but if you can't take the case of Africa, take the case of security, for example. You have a lot of insecurity in the Sahelian countries. So you find that the expenditures on security keeps going up, and expenditures on development keeps going down. Well, if you don't have security, you can't have development. And so countries are forced into an existential risk situation that they are forced to have to spend on security. Some of these security issue, insecurity issues 
comes out of things that it didn't cause. So you take the Lake Chad area of Nigeria. It's because of what happened actually in Libya. And you have all these uh, armed groups that I'll come back to those areas. So what I'm trying to say is if a country like Chad was spending so much of his money to combat terrorism, to avoid regional spillover effects of terrorists in the entire region. The question that you should ask is, why is Chad that's doing that on the benefit of everybody else being penalized for that? And so that's why I'm saying that when countries have external security shocks that it didn't cause, and they are forced to have to come up with monies to do that. Again, I don't believe that those things should count towards their debt. And in fact, on the issue of security, that's why the African Development Bank, because I, I, I looked, Gene, at the, you know, we used to look at security as exogenous, so to the development process. But in fact, it's not. It's really endogenous to it. So we must be able to link security to growth, I mean to investment, to growth and development. And then have new instruments as multilateral development banks, like in our case, you may not have that situation, but allows our borrower countries or, or regional member countries to have bigger pools of instruments to deal with it. And that's why at the African Development Bank, we are now working on the development of what we call security index investment bonds. That will be um, investment bonds that we issue uh, when designed on the capital markets and we will raise the money to allow countries to uh, basically build up their security architecture. I mean, I'm not talking guns or anything like that, uh, but also to repair damaged infrastructure in areas that have been destroyed by, uh, uh, by conflicts. It's so many of those areas exist. Then to build social infrastructure, that's water, sanitation, health, schools, and all things like that. Because if you don't have the hearts and mind of people, you lose, you lose everything but also to protect areas in which it has strategic investments, right? So for example, we had in Mozambique, we invested, uh, we helped them to put together a $24 billion transaction uh, which on liquefied natural gas. That's now making them the third largest producer of natural gas in the world. Now, but as soon as we finished, the terrorists went over there. And we thank God for President Kagame of Rwanda President Sri Ramaphosa of South Africa and the South Africans have said I help all that. But the countries need more resources. So what I'm trying to say is that we need more ways of trying to deal with that. And the last one I want to mention on this is what happens to countries that, let me just take like Africa, and I don't, because I don't understand a little bit what this would be in your region. But take the Congo Basin of Africa, which is the lungs of Africa, really. It's like, the Amazon. Well, when I actually save forest and I sequester carbon, I'm basically saving the world in terms of um, all the negative externalities for climate change. But I'm not paid for that. I get absolutely nothing for that. Then I'm told that my debt to GDP ratio is high. Well, the question to really ask is, if you do debt to GDP ratio, if I'm measuring my GDP, I must begin to ask the question, what is the growth process that generates that GDP? And what are the negative externalities of that GDP that you're talking about? Because if you actually have a wide, big GDP that is generating global negative externalities, you are actually growing at my expense. And so if I'm actually sequestering carbon, it means that I'm actually saving the world. So which means that if you actually index my GDP based on the positive externalities that I'm actually, I mean, the, the externalities I'm avoiding, then it means that my uh, uh, denominator actually goes up, right? And it means that my debt to GDP ratio goes down. And that, that space that you have is what I can use to say, I want to invest more in green infrastructure. I want to invest more in renewable energy and things like that. So I do think we need to question. Um, the UK, um, you know, the, what is the report that you financed from the FCDO by Professor 
Das Gupta, I think it was Das Gupta's report that we're looking at biodiversity and, and, and all of these things. So I think we need to question, it's my position that we need to question how we actually measure uh, 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 GDP uh, 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 a lot of, uh, of countries. It's, it's, it's just uh, the, the value of goods and services that is produced in an economy, but it doesn't really tell you um, how that is produced and what the negative externality of that is. And when we talk about climate change, we are going to, um, to COP27. Right? So we still talk about the $100 billion that developed countries have to pay for developing countries. But that's not really based on anything, you know. It's just out of the air. The question to ask is, what is the delta of the growth that developed countries have had over time at the expense of developing countries? That's what we should be talking about compensation for, not the willingness to compensate for just a particular level. So there's quite a lot of methodological issues that we still have to deal with. Um, oh, yes, um, on the issue of China and infrastructure. Well, you know, what happens with um, um, infrastructure is the fact that uh, many African countries have massive infrastructure deficit. So annually, that amount is about 68 to $108 billion. And that's even before COVID-19. So it's gone up significantly since that time. The issue is how to finance that infrastructure. Financing that infrastructure, most of it is actually financed by government. And governments take, they find that they can't really cope and they, they, they begin to borrow money from capital markets. Uh, quite a number of countries also um, uh, go to China to do infrastructure for them. Um, and of, of course the issue is uh, not the fact that China is doing it. The question is um, what kind of arrangements have been reached and what types of um, asymmetric negotiation power exists when you're trying to, a small country, you're trying to deal with a big country. Um, and so one of the things that we do as African Development Bank is we have something called the Africa Legal Support Facility, which supports countries in negotiation contracts uh, with China, with anybody for that matter, to make sure that you look at the little prints to make sure that you, it's not an asymmetric negotiation and that this transaction is in your interest. But of course, uh, countries make their decision, but we have the facility that supports. I'll give you an example. In one country, which I will not name, we help them to renegotiate their contracts with another third country in terms of their debt obligation arising from that contract we renegotiated it down by 94% just by using the Africa legal support facility. So all I'm trying to say is that um, support countries to have the capacity to understand, to, to be able to negotiate, that's very, very important. But I'll say one thing about the issue of infrastructure, one thing that I do not like anywhere, and that is the fact that I do not subscribe to and I will not accept that African countries will under any country, to any country for that matter, use their natural resources to back loans, right? No, that is the worst kind of thing that you can do, right? Because you cannot mortgage off the future of economies just because you want to do infrastructure uh, today. And that's why I really believe that really um, one of the things that we have to really make sure that it's not just governments that should be doing infrastructure should get private sector doing infrastructure, and that will reduce the debt obligation of countries, and therefore the affinity of countries sometimes to go and look for those kind of structures that may not be sometimes in their best interest. A final question. Okay, so good night, doctor. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, when during the pandemic, I was um, part of the CARICOM. They're doing this program for the youth, and I was part of it. And agriculture was something that they were talking about a lot. Um, I never like to get my hands in dirt, but then I'm like, I love to eat vegetables and fruits and food, you know, itself. Because rice also grows from the <laughs> earth. So. Um, I just wanted to ask, is there a 
agriculture house, you know, like a farm within a house. Because when I'm thinking about like um, the the flood, you know, when that happens, things things go down, you know, no food, not much growing, you know. I've seen people build buildings and everything, like, you know, to have a house where there's a farm, it's not gonna be like, I'm sure there's plenty of lands. I love, you know, you know, to find a good piece of land and have this, I don't know how, I'm not a scientist, but you know, to build it in a way that you'll be able to have a farm. And when there's flood, um, it wouldn't affect agriculture as much. I don't know, the idea just came into my, um, my mind and um, I just wanted to ask. And also for the Turks and Caicos, um, we don't have like a huge, huge farm, which I see that we should have, because I feel as if, if we start to grow our fruits or veggies and stuff, like, you know, things here are super expensive. And, you know, I just, I'm, I'm interested, and I just want to see, like, where we can go around it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, thank you um, very much. The first is, please have a seat. Yeah, okay. thank you. Um, I think the, the, the issue with um, agriculture and young people is one that I discussed quite a lot today uh, with the Minister of uh, um, Agriculture and, and all that. And, um, you know, you can imagine. Let me just try this and see how, 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 how guy, you guys are going to. So let me start from that side. Um, you have a son or you have a daughter who wants to marry a farmer. What will you say? Can I have somebody respond? Comes home and said, Mom, Dad. I want to worry this guy, what am I, this lady, but she, he or she is a farmer. What will you say, madam? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, let me try on this side, right? Anybody, any takers? So that means no, right? So go marry a real doctor. Okay, right here. Oh my goodness. That guy's dead. All right, over there. Okay, I can get the, I get the picture. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that what you call your profession matters. So when you say the guy's a farmer, you all say, hmm, really? But that's exactly when I was minister in Nigeria, I decided to change that. I said, call them. Agri-preneur. An entrepreneur, agri-preneur. So madam, the guy walks in, say, ma'am, I want to marry this guy. What does he do? He's an agri-preneur. Oh, come in here. Huh? <laughs> come right in and give him some salad or something. It's, uh, you know, and what I'm saying is that we have to make agriculture cool. We've got to have people to understand that agriculture is not a way of life. Agriculture is not a development activity. Agriculture is not for poverty reduction. Agriculture is the biggest wealth creating sector you ever found. Look, you have oil, you have gas. Nobody drinks the oil, right? Nobody smokes the gas, but everybody eats food. In the case of Africa, the size of the food and ag market by 2030, we want trillion dollars. So when you want to actually do agriculture, you want to make sure that agriculture is, uh, is a premier. It's, it's, it's a sector for creating wealth. And that's why I was telling you that even I don't like the titles that ministers of agriculture are given. When I was minister of agriculture in Nigeria, I told the president, I said, I don't like my title. He said, why? He said, because um, it makes me feel I'm just doing some kind of farming. But agriculture is food and agribusiness. It's really food and agribusiness. So, that's really what we're talking about. And I'm saying this because to get young people to go into agriculture, we've got to change everything about it, right? It's cool. It's a sexy, it's a, it's a cool sector. I mean, just look at me. I'm a boat. I'm in agriculture, right? I'm an agripreneur, right? 
So, so I think that this, this really matters. And I, and I catch them young and change the mindset. It's very, very important. And agriculture is not just producing food. You produce the food, you process the food, you add value to the food, you store the food, you package the food, you market the food. Just imagine how much money you're making all across that. So I think that's how we have to look at, uh, at agriculture. So uh, Madam, I don't know where you are, but I think you, you, you just have to get your hand dirty, but that's gold in the dirt. So that's the, the point I want to say to you. Now, I want to say that in my last two days, of, two days I've been here, we've had a lot of conversations with the ministers, with the vice president, president of Caribbean Development Bank. In fact, today, I think, um, where is uh, Canada? I, I, yeah, I saw, yeah, yeah, you're right here, yeah, Peter. And, uh, and uh, we had discussions about, about this today. But I actually feel that we need to put together a program to support the Caribbean region in agriculture or food and agribusiness. Tourism is your big sector. But most, if not all, of the food that services that industry is, is important. So you have a big tourism industry that is not helping to actually transform your rural economy and allow young people to get into economic opportunities for servicing that industry. Now, if you want to grow, you can either grow horizontally, which you don't have the land to do because of the nature of things. Or you can have a stack up system and grow vertically. And I was telling the president of the bank today and his wife when we were talking, and I said, you know, it's like passing right through with what they say. Yeah, passing right through the airport. In the United States, you do TSA, right? I mean, it goes through TSA. Well, we can do TSA here, tourism, right? Services and agriculture. So anywhere you go in the Caribbean, you go have a TSA. And because you stack it up on tourism, that's like growing up vertically, right? And agriculture then becomes something that can serve that tourism industry um, in a way across the, 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 the Caribbean. And so to be able to do that, we've had a number of conversations. I've said that the bank, the African Development Bank, will like to work with, propose to work with the Caribbean Development Bank in three areas. One is structuring something together with, the, with you, with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. In, um, and also the tropical uh, SEAT that's in Colombia, the, the tropical, uh, International Tropical uh, uh, Actual Center that's in, in Colombia to look at access to technologies, to do fellowship program that train people in agriculture. So that's one thing. The second one, of course, is to look at agribusiness because you gotta build a whole supply chains for things. And the African Development Bank, and Caribbean Development Bank, and the African Development Bank can work together to build the agribusiness capacity in the Caribbean region. And we can work, and willing to work together with the Inter-American Development Bank and others, uh, because then you can get people to go to Latin America and all of that. So, but we, we're willing to, uh, to be able to support um, uh, some, uh, something like that. But also technology transfer. Yesterday, when I was talking to the premier, and um, actually twice he mentioned this to me. In the morning, he told me that, I think he said, when the ships don't come, it's like, yeah. Can we have a microphone for the climate? Yeah. Uh, we were talking about the issue of food insecurity. And what I said was that, uh, fortunately for Turks and Caicos, the ships came because we only get food when the ships come. Uh, but if it was a, a worse pandemic that prevented the ships from coming, we would have been in real trouble. So it highlighted 
and put um, sharp focus on the need to develop the agricultural sector, uh, if only from the perspective of being able to supply some of the food needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that is true for, uh, to, a, to a varying degree for most of the Caribbean, particularly Turks and Caicos in the Bahamas. Yeah, so, so I, I really agree with you. you know, when you said that, that hit me. It's like, if the ships don't come, then people starve. And, and that's not acceptable. So I think we've got to make sure that that is not, that over-concentration and dependence is not good. Um, and so one of the things that I want to propose to the president, uh, 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 is the issue of technology transfer program that we can run to, you know. For example, you mentioned to me rice. And you said that the areas that produce rice, or that can grow rice, are very saline soils, so high salinity. And I told you that actually that's not a problem because we have in Africa rice varieties that actually do well on very saline soils. So you got mangrove soils. So, so that all I'm saying is that our, our weather is similar in many, many ways. And so we should be able to do learning, technology transfer, um, see what we can do based on our experiences to help also you to develop your agriculture sector. You know, when I look at agriculture and I look at rural poverty, and people say, well, folks are just into subsistence farming. Well, what I say is I've never actually met a subsistence farmer in my life. I don't know where they are. If you see them, tell me, tell them I'm looking for them. The reason is because no person actually starts out to want to be poor. And my dream, Joe, I just want to be poor. No. What you find are actually people that are trying to be entrepreneurial, but they have boundary constraints around them. Lack of markets, lack of information, lack of infrastructure, lack of finance. And therefore, it conditions you to a particular production system that keeps you poor. So you don't start out to be a subsistence farmer. You just have too many bounding so what I think we really need to do is um, to make sure that we can get farmers financing the entire value chains that can allow productivity to rise, that can allow agriculture to be a business, a viable one. And the tourism sector becomes basically the uptake. Right? It creates a pool of uptake for this new agribusiness sector that you want to create. Uh, across the, 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 the Caribbean. So it's the stacking up, uh, which is that, that's what of the, uh, that we were talking about with tourism and also services and agriculture. I think that would be uh, great. But I want to encourage the, the, uh, the shareholders of the bank. First, let me thank you for all the great support that you are giving to the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean needs your support. They need your support to deal with climate change. They need your support to deal with the issue of jobs. They need your support to deal with the issue of diversifying their economies. And I'm sure that in your discussion with your governors and the directors of the bank, you are having this conversation. So if there's anything that I can say that I came here to do is I want to lend my very, very strong voice of support for the Caribbean Development Bank and to also say that we at African Development Bank, because we're pretty close in terms of history, in terms of, um, of our peoples, and also in terms of opportunities, we are willing to really work with you to see how we might be able to enhance uh, this cooperation and partnership between uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Caribbean and, 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 uh, and Africa. And in, in, in what I've seen today, um, and actually the last two days and conversations that I have seen, I can tell you one thing. The Caribbean is bankable, and we should invest in it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.
We just have one final item before we close, and I'd like to ask my colleague, Dana Wilson-Patrick, who serves as general counsel for the Caribbean Development Bank, to just offer the vote of thanks. Dr. Additioner, <laughs> Dr. Additioner, we need you back on stage one final time. I'd just like to offer you this small token from the Caribbean so that when you return to Africa, when you return to your home base, you will have a memory of us, and hopefully that will mean you will come back very soon. Oh, yes. <laughs> I myself don't know what it is, yes. so let, yeah. it, let it remain a surprise. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. So, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, a good evening from me. Um, the task of acknowledging all the participants of this memorial lecture falls to me. As we conclude our marquee event of the bank's 52nd annual meeting, we extend, extend sincere appreciation to the Premier, Mr. Mizik, and the government and people of the Turks and Caicos Islands for the hospitality extended to us. We're grateful to TCI for not only hosting the annual meeting, but for the yeoman support that they've provided to ensure a successful event. To the President of the African Development Bank Group, Dr. Adishina, Sincerest thanks to you for continuing to deliver and to build on the inspiring legacy of the William G. DeMas Memorial Lecture. This has definitely been the lecture that has topped all so far. The spirit and heritage of William DeMas lives on in you. Thank you for giving your time and for sharing so vividly your perspectives on the development and challenges, the experiences and lessons from the African Development I understand now why you began with agriculture. It is your heart, and it, it is our hearts too. Your style, your delivery, your messages were evidence that we are separate over the miles, but we are definitely connected. I'm very hopeful for what will come in the future and that we will build on what has begun here this evening and over the past two days. To our Vice President of Operations, Mr. Isaac Solomon, thank you for being our co-pilot on this journey. <laughs> Your service in the airline sector has pro pro proved very useful in ensuring a safe and successful takeoff, and ultimately, hopefully, there will be a very successful landing. <laughs> to Camille Taylor, our host and our mistress of ceremonies, we appreciate your guidance in weaving continuity into what was a smooth and enriching program. And finally, to those joining us here in TCI and online, we appreciate your time and the high level of engagement and attention that's been demonstrated this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. And that concludes our proceedings this evening. Please join us for some light refreshments. Thank you very much for coming.